Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes, we shall be discussing wide gauge derailment risks. Uh, I'll be providing an overview into the history of the stats and, to the, and into why it's important. Rich Gibson will be giving us a whistle stop tour into some of the different gauge spread risks and what we're doing to address these. And then Andy Turner will be offering us a deep dive into one of these risks into the uh, RT60 and what we're doing to resolve it. So firstly, what is track gauge? Track gauge is the distance between your left and right rail, as shown on the photograph on the top right-hand corner. And we measure it using two techniques. We measure it dynamically with a dedicated fleet of track geometry recording vehicles. And we also measure it manually uh, using static techniques of uh, measurement instrumentation. And both these systems output uh, geometry data, which can uh, guide maintenance communities to know where they need to go to rectify wide gauge faults. But then why is wide gauge important? Simple answer, a train will derail. Trains are unable to respond to sudden changes in wide gauge, and as a consequence of that, they'll fall into the forefoot. This photograph was taken at uh, Doncaster, I believe, many years ago, and because of the lateral forces of the train going over the track, the components holding the rails were unable to uh, maintain the design gauge, and as a consequence of that, the train fell into the forefoot. We are yet to design a technology whereby trains can respond to sudden changes in track gauge, with exception in Japan, where they have a variation in their gauge, and they've actually built this into their system. It would be fascinating to see if we could ever do that for discrete uh, gauge faults. I could see uh, Gareth's uh, mind ticking over on that. <laughs> when we look at the track geometry trends of gauge, we have the, uh, this graph on here provides us with an overview of the history of track geometry faults, which we have been recording since 1997. And the red line denotes track gauge. And as can be seen, well up to about 2004, gauge was quite sporadic in its, uh, in its output. However, since then, it's been relatively stable to the point where we introduced tight gauge around 2010 from Euro norm standards. And the benefit of this data that we provide our regulator is that it's able to tell us the picture of the condition of our track, which is monitored by our track recording vehicles. However, as I'll discuss later, we have identified that a number of gauge spread derailments are occurring on track which is man manually captured. And these stats are not visible inside these graphs. That is until the introduction of Tiger and the training up of tech teams to encourage them to put uh, their manual geometry data into a system. And it's providing us with this picture where we can understand the situation on manual geometry sites for a twist and gauge. We also use the wrong side failure 50 plus report, which denotes, um, in the case of track geometry, where we have blocked line, twist, and gauge faults. As can be seen, since about 2017, we've had four blocked line twist faults supported, but yet we have quite a high number of blocked line gauge faults supported. And this is on average almost like one and a half every year. And when we compare this to the ratio of derailments which track gauge has been a contributing factor, we can see that since 2015, we have had about, roughly about 17 track gauge related derailments. And it's been about since 2015 that this number has substantially increased, hence why we are now focusing on the um, impact of gauge spread and what we can do to try and resolve it. As an outcome of the Eastleigh derailment, we were tasked to provide a review into gauge spread derailments. And from this, we identified that the majority, about two thirds of these, were occurring on sites which would have been manually captured. Um, these were like freight branches, freight sidings, or um, station sidings. And we also found that the majority of them were also occurring on plain line. And this led us to go into a deep dive into the techniques around how we monitor gauge spread and the processes around manual geometry inspection. And when we look at the causes and the contributing factors of these uh, 17 derailments, which have occurred since 2005, we found a huge proportion of them were due to timber sleeper failures. When we go out to uh, conduct engineering verifications, it's always very fascinating to spend time with the tech teams. And when we go on to sites such as the one shown here, pushing a, 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 a piece of recording equipment along the track statically, and it may show that the track is within gauge. But if we haven't got visibility of the track components demonstrated on the photograph on the right-hand side there with high levels of ballast in the forefoot, how can we be certain that uh, the track gauge is still being maintained? So it's understanding that culture and uh, identifying the contributing factors to these derailments and then communicating those out to the wider audience so that we can raise awareness to resolve the problems. And I'll leave you now with some photographs of recent uh, gauge spread related derailments um, for you to dwell on and uh, I'll hand you over to Rich Gibson. Thank you. Uh, 
thanks, Chris. Um, so, like Chris said, I'm going to be going through a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the um, some of the risks we have on our network with regards to gauge spread. Um, there's a list down the um, top right there, um, starting off with ineffective wood sleepers and pan eights, the lock spikes, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about them. I think we all know what a rotten sleeper looks like and and what we had to do with the pan eights um, going back from the shearing of the, the lock spikes. So I'm going to talk about the... Um, the SHCs and then some of the longitudinal bearer failures um, and timber SNC broken screws and concrete SNC broken screws. And then Andy's going to talk about the um, SNC broken housings with a Valve BTR T60. So if we start with the SHCs, I'm going to go through the failure mechanism. So the left hand picture shows where the hoop has failed and detached from the sleeper. That means it's got absolutely no lateral restraint um, to, to hold gauge at that point. This increases the forces um, on the adjacent sleep hoops and, and in turn those increased forces can cause those, those hoops on the adjacent sleepers to fail. Uh, and this has a knock on effect to the, the next let, lot of sleepers. Um, and what you effectively get uh, is the rail unzips. Um, so you can see on the right hand picture there how you've got three completely gone and the forces have spread out onto the, the ones adjacent to it. Uh, I don't know how quickly the rail unzips in these situations, but in, um, in my 20 years of maintenance on the Plymouth section, um, I've had two occur occurrences. Um, one was um, with eight consecutive sleepers, which was found in a possession on a Sunday morning by the patroller. And the other one was around about 13 consecutive sleepers um, without, any, um, housing, without any hoops at all, um, which again was found on a Sunday morning by a patroller. Um, bearing in mind that the patrollers there every couple of weeks, um, you, you can sort of surmise from that that it happens fairly quickly. So how do we identify the failed hoops? Um, the top left picture there shows the most common failure method, uh, the most common failure mode, um, where the interface between a sleeper and a hoop, uh, the, the hoop breaks at that point, and that's where the water lies, you get the corrosion. Um, and it's very difficult to identify it. Um, if you look at the bottom picture on the left, there's a, you can see the left-hand side of that hoop is just very slightly higher. Um, when you look at the right hand side, uh, there are three hoops in a row there, which were all broken on the one side of the hoop. Very difficult spot. Um, all of these pictures, by the way, uh, apart from any derailments, are from my own um, inspections. So this, this is all very relevant. Um, so you can identify them by kind of walking down the forefoot. If you're the right height, you look down at the rail and uh, if the hoop isn't parallel to the rail, assuming your, your sleepers are all square, then you can just see one side slightly higher. That's probably one of the best ways. But if you've got a site and you want to actually know how, how uh, much of a problem you've got on it, you can go down there, tactile inspection. Um, there's a very short clip here um, showing how a very simple but laborious method, you can work out how, how much of an issue you've got. It is slow, but when you compare it to getting down on your hands and knees and getting down at eye level so you can see it, it's probably fairly quick and not as back-breaking. So what are we doing about SHC's um, F19? So we're, we're looking at the, um, uh, the use of PLPR to identify faults within um, F19 areas. Um, so we've been having um, workshops along with... Uh, Omnicom Balfour BT Rail to develop PLPR to pick up SHC sleeper defects. Um, we've carried out trials and comparisons um, against visual inspection um, to, to see sort of how the learning is going um, in this process. So the, the top middle um, picture there shows you what it, what it will pick up at the minute. So it will pick up any sleepers where it's got a clip missing. Now, whether that's a clip missing um, because it's come loose, which is unusual because you get a decent tow load on an on a SAC clip, 
or whether it's because the hoops are broken and the clip's gone missing. That, that will be picked up by the PLPR. Um, if you look at the bottom six pictures, bottom left, um, they're all broken hoops which haven't been picked up. And there's also that top left picture shows an item that hasn't been picked up. Um, so there are, there are limitations at the minute. Um, so it won't identify hoops which are broken on the, the shoulder of a hoop or where they're broken at the interface on one side at the minute. And then the, the second from bottom photo is where the, the complete end of a sleeper has gone missing. It won't identify that because it thinks that it's covered in ballast. So it thinks it's got a, uh, a, an overload of ballast there. It doesn't realise the sleeper end has gone. And c another common fault with the, F with the F19s is the sleepers can crack where the hoops go into the sleeper. So that bottom picture there shows that. Um, and it hasn't been able to pick up that yet. It is a learning procedure. So as, as we go on, the PLPR will learn and will be able to pick up uh, more stuff um, as, as it's trialled. Um, but as it stands at a minute, um, it's likely to uh, pr progress, go live um, with um, some, some trial sites initially. Um, and there will be a briefing that goes out with it to say what the limitations are um, when it goes out so that it's then down to the TME to understand what their risks are on their sites and, um, and then to apply uh, their, their knowledge, their uh, judgment on whether they'll actually use this or not. I'm going to move on to long bearer systems. Um, so we've got a few pictures there. Uh, the top left was um, Bexley, that was um, 1997. That's where we had the eight wagons come off and um, there were four members of public injured in that one who were working in the, around the arches below. Um, the top centre one you've probably all seen before, that's Paddington. Uh, the right hand side, this is Prideau Viaduct on the Newquay branch, that was back in March 2005. Um, I'd been the ATM on, on that area for about a year at that point. And then the bottom three on the left, they are Wanstead Park. So that was January 2020. Um, there was, those photos were of a destruction following the derailment as the train continued for six miles, sorry, six minutes, two and a half miles, and um, damaged a further seven long bearer system structures um, following on from that. So what are the issues? The issues with the long bearer system structures, why are they so difficult to manage? Um, you've got a lot of unusual and bespoke design, um, bespoke designs, bespoke components, and they are, they're not very easy to manage within ellipse. Um, it's difficult to observe them under traffic, to see what, the, what movement you're getting, that's you know, down to your tight clearances and your lack of access opportunities. Uh, it's difficult to measure dynamic movement. So I'm not talking about just dynamic geometry, I'm talking about the difference between the static geometry and your dynamic geometry. So you need to know what that movement, what movement is happening so you can understand um, from the forces on this structure uh, and on the system what's moving just to be able to understand it once you can understand it then you can know, you know what you need to do if anything needs to do and to rectify any issues there's a lot of hidden elements um, when you look at the top left photo there the Wanstead park and then the top right photo um, that they, they both had walkways which were obscuring inspection um, so if you can't see the components you, you're not going to know when they're when there's issues with them and when you need to uh, like you need to intervene with um, maintenance in order to put those issues right and um, you may have limited experience and knowledge um, we are losing a lot of experience um, I mean you can look at Scott how much experience is in that head um, and and he goes next week um, and as as we move on we will be losing uh, more experience more knowledge and uh, then you're, you're looking at familiarity with the asset as well. So the, the two are kind of intertwined. Um, we don't, we're unable to get out on track as much as we used to. Um, TMEs have uh, extremely high workloads. Um, so you've got the access issues, you've got the workload issues, um, you've got the boots off ballast um, policy 
it all adds up to lower familiarity with your risk assets. And because every long timber bridge is different, long tunnel barrier bridge is different, um, you need to know them like the back of your hand in order to know what the issues are. Um, the photos there, um, uh, just looking at the bottom centre one is just showing um, how uh, the, the bespoke components for each one, that everything is different. The, um, the bottom right photo shows some void in underneath, which you wouldn't be able to spot from above. It's just because I was able to get underneath and uh, put a step gauge in there that I realised actually you've got a seven mil of void in there um, and that's going to be an issue. And then the bottom left one is a, um, that is something I knocked up when I was, um, I had an issue with a, a long timber bridge on um, the Park and Dillett branch down in Cornwall. Um, because you can't get, you, there's nothing to show you voiding and your, your movement of the whole rail and the timber together. So this was just a method to, to use void meters to understand what the rotation and the voiding difference was on that. And we've all used cameras for um, looking at uh, um, components under load and that, but having a GoPro on a stick is a really simple and effective way of having a look at difficult to get to places, as demonstrated there. That was at Carmarthen um, Bascule Bridge, which was a bridge I went to look at as a result of a request following from the community of practice. So what progress have we made with long bearer systems? Well, we had SIN 196, and we're in a better place for this now. Um, so we now know where our higher risk um, uh, structures are, and we've carried out non-destructive testing on them as part of a SIN. Um, Microdrilling is a really good tool, but you've got to understand um, how to use it and how to interpret the, the results of it. So if you look at the, the bottom picture there and the, the A and B readouts, exactly the same timber, um, in the same place, but in different directions of drilling. Um, that was one of the Wanstead Park timbers, um, which was uh, investigated following on from the development. Um, so we're, we're also looking at doing some detailed examination of long bearer training. Um, so we're developing a, uh, a training program, which is in three modules. Um, module one is your fundamentals. Module two is understanding your detailed examination. And module three is a micro drill and application. Module one's pretty much complete. Module two and three are ongoing. Um, on top of that, we've got changes to the, uh, the TRK3038, which is a long bearer system standard. Um, this includes uh, things such as um, mandating the use of a LIPS for your, for your long bearer system register, uh, which was one of the outputs of SIM 196. Um, you know, down the bottom left uh, is, a, is a boron gel trial, which we've done. Um, so this is, um, this is boron gel, because we can no longer use boron rods. Um, it's useful for softwoods where you want to extend the life of your timber. It won't make your timber um, any better or, or in, you know, if, if it's already lost some integrity, it's not going to repair it, but it will slow down the decay. Um, this was on um, one of Sarah's, obviously I was still here, one of her bridges down at Ely. Um, so we're, we're waiting for, um, uh, we're, we're just currently waiting for the company Safeguard to put together a, a methodology and, and a, uh, an installation pack for this. Um, in the meantime, we're, we're monitoring to ensure there's no adverse effects on this particular bridge and in October there'll be a revisit and um, uh, just to see, we'll re-drill it then and see if it's had much of an effect or, or what the effect is. Uh, we've got the community to practice. That's been mentioned a few times today. So um, we've held a, um, an open forum fairly recently. We're trying to hold three a year and um, that you get a lot of questions through that so we can actually deal with um, frontline issues. It's been quite well attended and quite well received. But there's, uh, there's myself, I can be contacted um, uh, directly as the technical lead. Um, we also have a working group of about half a dozen of very experienced and knowledgeable engineers. And um, anything we can't deal with, then we can open up to the, uh, the wider audience of a community of practice. Just can talk about screws in timber layouts now. So the, the couple of photos there, or three photos, you've got Sheffield, which is a top, 
and then you've got um, East Somerset Junction. Um, both were down to uh, screws breaking in wooden layouts. So following on from Sheffield, and, and bearing in mind I was a TME in Western and Wales and Western at this point, which is why I'll, I'll use this example, um, there was an inspection notice um, issued, and from that we were to check a selection of similar Fletcher type radius timber layouts uh, with freight traffic. Um, as a result of this, and it was an arduous task, it was checking throughout the um, non-moving parts of the SNC uh, with a T-bar spanner every single um, screw. Um, so I found uh, on two layouts some, um, some broken screws, which you would not have found with uh, your Mark I boots. They, you kick them and they wouldn't move. So it's, it was a really good methodology to do that. Um, the similarity between the two I found, which is on the bottom right two photos, is a slight misalignment uh, on the joint. And this is at, at the joint of the crossing unit. Um, so you've got that, uh, that lateral impact um, which has probably um, caused the lateral movement on the, um, the base plates um, at that point. Um, funnily enough, you, you just would not have seen or you could not see any sort of shuffle. Um, there, there was a maximum of a millimetre that you could see there. But it's worth bearing in mind that it's not just the S&C where you're going to get your broken screws and your timber layouts. Um, the top two photos are the, uh, the world famous uh, Royal, Ab Royal Albert Bridge from, um, uh, built by Brunel, not personally, but and, um, very good condition, very good condition sleepers. Um, you wouldn't really know much, of, much was wrong with it other than the slight uh, running band issue on the left hand side there. Um, so going into uh, more detail uh, inspection, found five broken screws there. The bottom one is on the Newquay Branch Ponce Mill. Um, ballast was covering any sort of shuffle, um, that, so you couldn't see any shuffle at all. Remove the ballast just by noticing something wrong, 10 broken screws in there. Um, so it is a real issue and something that we're, move, we're doing some work on at the minute. So Sheffield derailment, um, We've got some, um, we have some recommendations which we're working on from that. Um, and as a result, um, I'm just going to flick through these couple of slides because we're running out of time. Um, that's just telling you what actually happened at it. So these are some of the screws. So the recommendations that we need to look at is identify uh, and identification of high risk sites and robustness of gauge inspection at these sites. Um, review of geometry measurements and management, um, including use of MPV and um, regular geometry, uh, manual geometry reviews, the trace reviews, or as such with the, um, with the uh, manual geometry. Use of MX codes, because there are a lot of um, work orders here, um, which were deferred maintenance work, and review the practice of reusing screws, um, and also if are they fit for purpose, these screws? And the, the picture on there shows a couple of the broken screws. They're both broken 80 mil down, uh, which is very similar to um, your, your concrete screws and the lights as well. So um, as part of the recommendations, the TA has been utilising finite element analysis, FEA simulation software, to analyse the point of failure for AS screws. Firstly, we have reverse engineered pan V base plate, pan draw clips and AS screws to enable us to build a digital assembly to run the simulation. Solid Solutions, who are through one of the exhibitors through there, um, have scanned these components and created a, an editable SolidWorks CAD model using a Creaform HandyScan 700, uh, which is an accuracy, accuracy of up to 0.03 mil. And CAD models cleaned up using specialist software and mess sketches uh, created to each component to be used in SolidWorks. So, um, once SolidWorks assembly is put together, made a number of assumptions on the constraints with the model as shown here, and applied frictional contacts and forces to run the simulation. This work is currently ongoing, so we're looking forward to give you the, um, the outputs of that when we get them. And finally, for me, on the broken screws and concrete layouts. Um, so January 2022, uh, Truck Patrol discovered a significant number of broken screws at Kingsbury, Kingsbury Junction. Uh, these were found to be in the movable area of a switch and the base plate has been left completely unrestrained. Um, 
uh, this same layout that had failures back in um, 2010, um, which contributed to the publication of SIM 105. Um, there's a number of other layouts, very similar situations, which is why SIM 105 has now been reissued as issue two um, in March. And uh, my final slide, this is a, um, another example, Oxford Road in Reading, where they're continually having the broken um, screws in their concrete layouts. Again, uh, tight radius, uh, heavy freight, and um, uh, some photos of the screws are all breaking in very similar positions. Um, so as TA, we're, we're hoping that once we get some of the results through from the, the screws from the FEA, from the timber layouts, we can use some of that knowledge within the um, concrete layouts as well to go forward with that. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Andy Turner, who's going to be talking about the RT60 housings. Afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be finishing off the presentation today talking about uh, another specific risk for uh, wide gauge derailments, um, and that's specifically Balfour BT RT60 elevated housings. So I'm going to go through a background to Eastleigh, which is the incident that kind of kicked all of this work off. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we believe the failure mechanism was in that instance and, and is continued to be. Um, and then I'm going to go through the, the response that we followed over the last couple of years trying to manage the risk. So quick show of hands. Is everyone aware of the Eastleigh derailment? Who, who knows about that? OK, most of the room, that's good. Um, so, the Eastleigh derailment happened in January 2020, um, just outside the station, a freight train traversing one of the crossovers um, outside the station. It was going over a design of SNC uh, called RT60, which you've probably heard of. There were four different types of uh, RT60 SNC, and this specific one was made by Balfour BT. Um, and it used a specific design of um, elevated housing, um, which holds the rail clip that keeps the, the rail in place. And it was these housings that failed and contributed to the derailment. So some pictures from the site there, um, taken by Matt, who I think is in the audience today. Um, so you can see where the, the stem that holds the housing in place has failed um, on the top left photo. And this is pretty common for all of the housings we do find. They fail in the same place. The housings themselves are held in the concrete bearers um, through what we call a drilling glue process. So rather than what would normally be the case for most um, concrete sleepers in plain line, for instance, uh, where the housings would be cast in as part of the concrete production process. For these specific housings, the concrete is cast first, and then once that's completed, they then drill a hole in the concrete, insert the stem of the housing, and then fill it with resin to glue it in place. And we believe the resin is potentially what's contributed to the failures here. You can see on the right-hand side, I think Rich mentioned earlier, the potential unzipping that you might see when you have a fastening-related failure. And that's what we believe happened at Eastleigh, where maybe only three or four of the housings had failed initially, but then the additional load um, from the train that did end up derailing has unzipped a number of other housings that were adjacent to that that were susceptible to the failure. And I think in this case, there were about eight housings altogether that failed, which was enough for the gauge to spread sufficiently for the derailment to take place. So moving on to the mechanism of failure itself, as I said, the housing is held in place using a resin once the, the hole is is drilled in place. Um, and we believe that it's the resin itself that's um, failing at some point in its life, lifetime that um, then allows the stem itself to break. There's another factor here at play, though. Um, we've got other housings that have a similar design with stems in the concrete. But a particular feature, we keep calling them elevated housings. And that's really because the height of the housing itself is much taller than other types of housing. And you can see on the um, illustration on the right a bit of a comparison of where the load that would be applied from the rail foot on a Balfour Beatty housing compares to something on a standard shoulder, um, like on a plain line sleeper or, for instance, NR56V housings. Um, and it's quite a significant difference. And that extra height is going to apply more turning moment to the stem than you would expect ordinarily. Um, and you can see that the difference in height between the failure plane and, and where the load's being applied is sort of 85 to 100 millimetres, which is quite a long way. Moving on to some of the visual telltales that we know we see when these housings start to fail. Anyone who's been working on this design the last couple of years will probably have seen these as part of the SIN, but it's really worth reiterating these again today. Um, the first one on the top left is probably the most crucial in my opinion. Um, so it's where we see there's a gap that the housing is lifted away from the concrete. 
Normally following the manufacturing process, you'd expect to see kind of like a fillet bead of the resin around the bottom of the housing. And if the housing hasn't moved, that should stay in place. But as soon as you get relative movement between the housing and the concrete, you'll start to see a gap appear, potentially some cracking in that area. In some cases, we've seen gaps of sort of up to two millimeters. It's really quite obvious. In other cases, not so much. The other telltale signs are really indicative of um, high lateral forces through the site. So telltale two and four are really about indicating that. So if you've got excessive wear or signs of heavy localized contact um, in your SNC, that's potentially a good indication that the housing might be at risk of failure. And then also if you're seeing crushed nylon insulators, side post insulators on the top right there, and um, that's also a good indication that you've got high excessive lateral forces, which may then contribute to the housing failing. And then finally in the bottom, um, we also tend to see concrete dust and fines appearing around the side of the housing. This is another indication of relative movement. We've seen it as well with the screws that Richard's talking about. Um, and uh, it, the same applies here. Um, it's just a really good indicator of, of relative movement. Moving on to the risk factors, and these are really key. So when we uh, completed the sim, which I'll talk about uh, in a few moments, it was a really good opportunity for us to understand where these uh, failures were taking place and what the common risk factors were. And what we found out in pretty much 100% of the cases where we've seen elevated housing failures, it always happens on short switches and it always happens when there's heavy freight traffic over the layout. There are pretty much no exceptions to this rule, so it's a really important thing to take away. It doesn't always have to be just a C or a D switch. Um, when we've got similar flexure switches, um, that can also give us a really tight turnout radius, even on something like an F. The turnout radius could be down below 250 meters, and it's really the turnout radius that's the important factor here. The reason we think, uh, well, another reason we think this is potentially affecting the Balfour Beatty designs more than anything else is the geometry of that RT60 design. By definition, it was designed with a higher level of cant deficiency um, for a given speed compared with some of our existing vertical SNC. So for instance, going through a C switch um, at the, the speed that it's designed for would uh, provide a higher level of cant deficiency than the equivalent vertical switch. And that high level of cant deficiency is going to manifest itself as higher lateral forces going through the fasting system, which is potentially leading to the, the failures that we're seeing here. Finally, on this slide, the, the area where we always see these housings fail is between the heel of the crossing, uh, sorry, the heel of the switch and the crossing. This is the area where we've just got um, single housings accommodating the rail. There's no base plates. In the switch area, we've got these quite large piggyback base plates that are a bit more robust and aren't susceptible to the same failures. But between the heel of the switch and the crossing, we're just supporting the rail with these pair of elevated housings, and it's there that we see the failures. So moving on to what we've been trying to do about it. I've split this up into three areas, the short term, the medium term, and the long term. We've completed all the short and medium term actions, um, but the long term stuff is still ongoing. So I mentioned uh, the investigation that people like Mark and Matt did um, immediately following the incident. That gave us a really good insight as to exactly what happened um, and allowed us to start doing our initial investigations as to how we can um, manage the risk going forward. And shortly following the incident, we um, issued a SIN. Uh, and I know SINs can be really challenging um, to those in the maintenance community. You've got a lot on your plate all the time, and the SIN is just another piece of activity to do that. But it was really vital for us to do that piece of work so we could get that intelligence, understand how these are failing, where they're failing, and it helped us manage the risk going forward. And you can see on the bottom right there the output from the SIN in terms of how many other housings we found that had failed um, across the network beyond just the original Eastleigh derailment. Um, and these were mostly focused in Wessex, um, which isn't that surprising because they've got the largest population of this particular type of RT60 SNC. And they do seem to see a lot of freight traffic going over those layouts. So it, it matches up with the risk factors we talked about before. So following the SIN, um, we decided to update TRK001 Mod 5 so that we could implement some of the inspections that we were um, putting in as part of the SIN into a regular frequency. Um, for these specific layouts. And the inspections really do follow largely what we required in the SIN. So there's a visual inspection that's carried out um, roughly every 12 months, depending on the type of switch that you've got. Um, and then if you discover any telltale signs, then there's a tactile inspection to follow that up. 
There's some more pictures there from the engineering verification program that I've been doing over the last 18 months. And we keep finding these housings fail. So it really wasn't a one-off at Eastleigh. Um, we do believe it's an inherent design fault. There are some key risk factors, but we've got a lot of this SNC out there and we need to start managing the risk the best we can. So moving on to the long-term actions, um, which we'll go to a little bit more detail of. We, there was a RAIB report into the Eastleigh derailment and they gave Network Rail two recommendations. Um, they're on the screen there, I won't read them. Um, but effectively, we needed to understand what the risk was and how we were going to manage the design going forward. And I've been leading the action plan for managing those recommendations uh, since they were given to us. So I'm going to show you what we're doing in terms of actions. It's a bit of a busy slide, um, but the important thing to note is that we split out each of the recommendations into a number of different actions that we wanted to, uh, to do to manage the risk. The ones in green are the ones that we've already completed. The ones in the sort of salmon colour are still ongoing. I'm going to go into detail of two of them in just a second, but before I go on to the next slide, I wanted to highlight um, what we're doing in 1.5, which is some NDT studies. So we believe that we can identify the um, partial or complete failure of these housings through ultrasonic techniques. And we're just in the process currently of trying to um, commercialize some of the pilot for that. We've done an initial trial um, in Wessex um, with the MTC to prove the technology. Now we need to see if it works from a maintenance perspective in terms of uh, identifying where these housings do tend to fail. I'll move into just the other two actions. I've got a couple of slides on here. The first one was about redesigning the housing itself. So if you can make the housing more robust and supply that um, as part of the repair process to sites that have had failures, then we can be a bit more sure that the housing is going to um, last potentially through until renewal of the asset. Um, so the slide here shows some of the work that we um, undertook uh, with Progress Rail, um, who own the design. They did some FEA to try and understand um, why the housing was failing. Does it align with what we've seen in track? Um, and it turns out it does. Um, we can see the fatigue cracks initiate in the same place we see them in track. Um, so we could sort of validate what the FEA was showing us. What we're going to do about that with those results? Well, we can take the FEA and then start to build in a redesign that tackles some of the issues we've seen. So on the left side of the slide, you can see the existing design um, and a little line indicating where the failure tends to take place. And on the right hand side, you can see the proposed redesign, um, which we're about to prototype. And what this effectively does in two different ways, we move some of the anti-rotation features, which are the little ribs down the stem, further down the bottom, away from the area where the bending is taking place, because um, they act as stress raisers, and if we move them out of the way, we think we can improve the strength of the stem. And then also we've thickened the wall um, in the location highlighted B there, which will also improve the stiffness of the stem and prevent the bending potentially leading to the, the failures that we've seen. So before I move on, as I said, that housing is about to be prototyped and we're then going to undertake a series of mechanical tests to try and prove at least we've got a significant improvement over the existing design, um, after which we'll then hopefully make it available for use in the routes to uh, supply as part of any repair processes. The second action, which is now complete, um, is around the use of base-plated NR60 bearers in place of the elevated housing bearers. So where you've had issues where you've got potentially five or six housings that are constantly failing or certainly at high risk of failing. We're able to um, provide a NR60 style bearer, which is a standard base plated bearer with screws in place of those um, locations. And because the geometry is common between the two layouts, we can do that and supply effectively a, an off the shelf NR60 bearer, drop it in place. Um, it's still in around the eleva other elevated housings but we've removed the ones that are causing you the, the risk of, of failure. And we've already trialed this at Eastleigh. It wasn't on the layout that caused the derailment, but it was very close by on one of the diamonds there. And you can see in the images where the base plated bearers have been um, installed underneath one of the, the diamonds they've got there. And there's another couple of sites planned over this summer that um, we're going to be uh, installing those at as well. But finally, I didn't really want to end on a, a low point, but I thought it was really important to emphasize that the risk isn't going away. Um, this is another site on the West Coast Main Line. Um, this was quite recent in the last couple of months where we've seen effectively the same kind of failure that led to the derailment at Eastleigh. Um, there were 
large number of housings that had failed consecutively. And we were fortunate in this case that it was picked up by a patrol before it caused us an issue. But it just really highlights that the risk is there. Um, it's really important that we start to manage this as best we can. Um, and hopefully the, the actions that we're undertaking in the meantime are, are going to go some way to, to preventing that happening again. Finally, just wanted to summarise what we've all talked about today. I'm not going to go through it, but just wanted to um, yeah, really just make clear the actions that we're undertaking to try and manage the widespread derailment risk that we've got. Chris really helpfully showed how big the risk is at the moment. So there's quite a lot of work ongoing. So there's some uh, summarise on that slide there. Thank you very much.